And why don't everyone go ahead and take their Bibles and open to the book of Exodus, chapter 16. Exodus chapter 16, we're going to be looking at the first few verses in a few moments as we begin a new series, and the title of the message today is Engage the Process. Engage the Process. Since I was a kid, I've always been drawn to large bodies of water. So one of the favorite things about getting my license when I was 16 is that I could now drive to the ocean. I grew up in Rhode Island, so the ocean was never too far away, but too far to walk for sure. And I love to be able to drive to the ocean. I love to be able to drive out there at night, especially. I love to go out there at night and sit on the rocks and just listen as the waves came in and they would splash against the rocks. And I like to sit close enough to where I could feel the spray on a warm summer night. So the bright starry sky above me, a great expansive ocean before me, uh, enjoyed that a lot. One of my hesitations about moving to Grand Rapids, Michigan back in the late 90s uh, was that there was no ocean here. But Carla assured me that Lake Michigan looked just like the ocean. We were uh, just friends at the time when I first came out. So when I landed in Grand Rapids and she took me to see Lake Michigan and we stood on the shoreline and I looked over and indeed there were waves coming in and she said, you see? And I took in the sight and I looked at her and I said, Carla, have you ever seen the ocean? But actually, I've come to really enjoy Lake Michigan, and I actually like it more than the ocean, because once I actually started swimming in it, and there was no seaweed, there were no jellyfish to dodge or other surprises, and here's the biggest part. When I got water in my mouth, and it didn't taste disgusting, I thought, I like this. I like fresh water. I like those t-shirts and sweatshirts that say, no salt added. Yes, right. <laughs> Unsalted. Indeed. Uh, so, and it is a large enough body of water. I love that I can't see the other side. So it still has that great effect on me. Uh, and I love that, the safety of living by large bodies of fresh water as well. But my criteria still holds. I still feel like I have to live in a place where a large body of water, the Great Lakes work, has to be nearby, within driving distance that I can get to. One where I can't see the other side. There's something about standing on the shoreline, looking across the water and seeing the, the edge of the water and the horizon, knowing that there's this expanse. And I figured out one day what it is. And, and this is what came to me. Uh, the place where the water touches the shore is where time touches eternity. When I look across that expanse of water, what it reminds me of, of is this ever none unending possibilities of what the future holds, of what's still out there that still lies before me, the unexplored, things to discover, things to experience. I love life. And I look forward to heaven as this unending place of learning. I don't believe that we're going to know everything because that wouldn't be heaven for me. I want to continue to find out. I want to continue to discover. And I believe that God is full of eternal discoveries. And that's what that shoreline reminds me of, and looking out toward that horizon reminds me of. So needless to say, I'm not a big fan of the desert. Gazing across unending barren, barren lands holds no appeal to me. And yet, the wilderness is where God does his best work in our lives. Today we're going to begin a six-week series called The Wealth of the Wilderness. Wealth of the Wilderness, it's inspired by a book by the same title, written by author Rebecca Joy. I had the opportunity to meet and travel with Rebecca Joy over the last two weeks, and when I found out that she was an author and asked her about the books that she's written, she had most recently published a book called Wealth of the Wilderness. And when I learned that it was about spirituality and essentially desert spirituality, it had my interest because my degree, uh, one of the main areas of my degree was in desert spirituality, the Abbas and Amas of the early church that went out and sought God in the wilderness places. And so I thought, I need to grow an appreciation of this. I'd love to read your book. And so I downloaded it on Kindle. And while we were on buses or sailing on the Mediterranean and I had time between places and classes, uh, I read this book and I loved it so much that I couldn't put it down. I read the whole thing on my journeys. And I told her, I said, this is really exceptional. This really fills a gap 
that I had been looking for in understanding desert spirituality and the appeal that it has. And the premise of the book is this. We draw nearest to God in the wilderness periods of our lives, not in the places of comfort and ease. She writes about 10 postures that better position us to inherit wealth through our wilderness seasons of life. The first posture toward growth in the wilderness is that we must engage the process. But before we talk about that, we need to define what the wilderness is. So the first question is, what is wilderness? What is the wilderness? Rebecca talks about four common terms translated wilderness in the Bible. And the first one is midbar. Midbar is the most used biblical term for wilderness in the Bible, and it means uninhabited land. And then there's the word araba. Araba describes the steppe or a desert plain regions of the Bible. And it is ground that's dominated by salt, where there's little water and few plants. And then there's the Negev. And the Negev is a special region. It's the southern part of the country of Israel. Abraham spent a lot of time in the Negev. And the Negev, not only being a name for a place, but a meaning, it means dry. It's a rocky desert region. And then there's the Greek term, Eremos. And this word is most often used to describe wilderness regions. And sometimes the word Eremos is coupled with another Greek word called, word called tapos. And tapos means place. So together they mean deserted or wilderness places. And we see this again and again in the New Testament, especially in Jesus' life. One of the occurrences is in Mark 1, verse 35, where it says, And getting up early in the morning, while it was very dark, Jesus departed and went to a Eremos Tapos, a deserted place. And there he was praying. Jesus often went to the Eremos Tapos, the deserted place, in order to connect with the Father and to spend time with the Father in a wilderness place. The wilderness is a dry, deserted, lonely, desolated, uninhabited place. And in the Bible, it's used both literally and metaphorically. It describes real locations that sometimes people live in, in difficult circumstances or pass through in difficult times. It also calls forth the image of what life sometimes feels like for us. Maybe you feel like you're in a wilderness place in your life right now. I don't much like wilderness places. I prefer places nearby to large bodies of water. And I've come to prefer large bodies of fresh water. How many got that sticker on their car that shapes the outline of Michigan with the Great Lakes? I like that we're surrounded by large bodies of fresh water. My sister lives in San Diego and it is often droughts. We live in one of the best places on planet Earth if we ever find ourselves in the midst of a drought. I like that. And yet, the wilderness tends to be where God changes lives. The Bible is filled with stories about people and their wilderness experiences. There's Hagar, who was sent away into the wilderness by Abraham and Sarah because Sarah is jealous. She meets God in the wilderness. There's Moses, who lived in a palace of the Pharaoh, but enters into 40 years of wilderness where he meets God in a burning bush. And those 40 years was before he'd even lead the Israelites into their own 40 years of wilderness. There's Elijah who finds himself in the wilderness as he flees from Jezebel. And there's David who fly, finds himself in the wilderness as he flees from Saul. And there God shapes and forms him and prepares him to one day become king of Israel. And then there's the Israelites who spend 40 years in the wilderness. And then there's John the Baptist who is one as a voice crying out, where? In the wilderness. Make way the paths of the Lord. Because where is God going to come through? Where are you going to meet him first? In the wilderness. 
Then there's Jesus, though without sin, though living a perfect life, was not prepared to enter into ministry until he spent his own 40 days in the wilderness, hungry, thirsty, undergoing multiple temptations. And then there's Paul. You know, we we don't notice this about Paul because Luke passes over it so quickly. But Paul, after his experience on the Damascus Road, spends three years in the Arabian wilderness where he is transformed and prepared by God to begin ministry. And then there are people contemporary with Jesus and Paul, the Essenes. There's the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Did you know that there's the Essenes? And they believe that Israel had become corrupt, that the religious system had become corrupt. And looking at the Bible, they noticed that when God called people back, when he restored Israel, it was always during wilderness time. So they went out into the wilderness and lived there and sought God there. And then there's the desert fathers and mothers, the Abbas and Amas of the early church who went and sought God in the wilderness because they saw this pattern in the Bible. The wilderness is a major theme in the Bible. People are transformed in the wilderness. And the wilderness experiences of our lives continue to transform us. Let's go ahead and get into the text as we read Exodus 16, 1 to 3. The setting is Israel has been in the wilderness. They have been brought out from slavery, Egyptian captivity, And they haven't been in the wilderness too long. Let's see how it's going for them. The whole Israelite community set out from Elim and came to the desert of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they had come out of Egypt. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate food, all all the food we wanted. But you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. The word of the Lord. Are you sure? (laughs) So Israel has been freed from captivity. They haven't even been in the wilderness that long. Do they like it? No. One of the earliest examples of God forming his people in the wilderness is when he rescues the Israelites from Egyptian captivity. And he leads them into 40 years of desert wanderings. You know, it kind of reminds me of when I was a kid, and I, you know, I I get into trouble, and then when I got caught and got punished, I'd always make it worse. And my mom used to have a saying, out of the frying pan and into the fire. That's what it felt like for the Israelites. Out of the frying pan and into the fire. God delivers Israel from captivity, and he leads them on a journey through the wilderness, but do they like it? No, no. They're looking forward to the promised land as they leave the Egyptian captivity, but they didn't realize that God was going to take them the long way. What should have, by many estimates, said only taken them 11 days. What should have only taken them 11 days took them 40 years. Yes, God tends to lead us by the long way. Anyone experience that in their lives? And there's a reason for it. But in order to appreciate the reason, we need to look at it through a biblical lens, which is an Eastern lens, rather than a Western lens. So the next question is, which lens are you looking through? Rebecca Joyce, having spent a considerable amount of time in the Middle East, tells us that there's two different lenses. There's an Eastern lens and a Western lens, and these are different ways of seeing. And she says that the essential difference between the Eastern and Western lens, the Eastern and Western ways of seeing things, is form and function. She says that us Westerners tend to look at the world through a lens of form, a way, the way things look. While the Eastern world tends to look at the world through function, what a thing does. And she gives some examples in her book, which I change up just slightly to suit me a little bit. And she talks about cars and ways of describing cars. So my dream car is a Volkswagen van. Go ahead to the next slide.
There it is. This is my dream vehicle. Oh, and if I were to describe it to you, what would I say? Well, I want it to come in two-tone like this. It could be two-tone green like this one is, or blue, or even brown, you know, with a nice brown as darker and a tan to offset it. I want it to have the silver trim. I'd like it to have a roof rack. I like the symbol. I like this model. There are different models, but I want this one and I like the V shape on the front, and I like that Volkswagen symbol, although it could be a peace symbol, I'd be okay with that. <laughs> and when I describe the van, what do I describe? I describe what, it, what I want it to look like. I want it to be in mint condition. When you see this van that one day, God, have grace, I might have, I want you to feel like it looks so good that you wonder if you're back in 1969. Because how could a car like this look that good in Michigan after all these years? <laughs> but if someone from the East were describing this vehicle, they would probably describe it very differently than I described it. They'd probably talk about how reliable it is, how it's a, it's a, a vehicle that's known to travel over long distance. I mean, after all, this was the vehicle that they used to travel when they followed the Grateful Dead, right? <laughs> it's reliable. And then they would say, and there's lots of room in it. You can sleep in it. And not only, you can fit a couple of people, so you can, you can bring a family member or two or from friends with you in it. And it has a stove and a refrigerator in it, so you can cook and you've got everything you need right there to sustain you. It's like a little house on wheels. And they would talk about the spare tire and how even if you've got a flat, you can just change it out and you keep on going because that's what it's made for. It's made for trucking. It's made for long hauls. They would talk about its function. In fact, Rebecca talks about it in her book. She says, you know, one of the big differences she noticed between the West and the Middle East is the cars. She says, they got the same cars. She said, but in the East, you can see people with a Mercedes or an Audi. She says, well, there's one noticeable difference. Those cars are always dirty in the East. She says, because people don't buy cars. She says, you go to the West, you see someone with a Mercedes or an Audi, it looks nice. It's washed, it's looking good. She says, in the East, it could be all dented up and muddy. It doesn't matter. They're not even thinking about a car wash because they bought that vehicle because... It's a good solid engine. It's reliable. It gets them where they go. They don't really care about the look of it. It's not a status symbol. For them, it's about function. For us, it's about form. And form versus function tends to extend to our ideas of the individual versus the community perspective. In the West, we value individuality. I'm certainly guilty of this, right? We value the individual. Each one is responsible for their own success or failure. And quite frankly, if we're honest, success really is a matter of perception sometimes, isn't it? We've told our kids that, you know, sometimes one of their, someone they know has a real fancy car. I'm like, yep, there's a big bill payment on that. And when we were at the school, the Christian school, we found, and I worked on the board, I found out some people have real fancy cars, but they can't afford their tuition. Success, sometimes it's just a matter of perception, right? Form. But in the East, they value not individuality, but community, tribe. It's how they see, it's how they think. Success and failure of the family or the group is the most important thing. Triumphs and failures and difficulties are shared, and it's hard to fake that as a unit, as a group. And in her book, Rebecca talks about some of the downside of that too. And there are differences in what we see as the most important things in life. In the West, we tend to be goal-oriented. We want to reach our objectives quickly and efficiently. Westerners tend to focus on destination, the end result, the product, whereas Eastern eyes and an Eastern lens tends to focus on the journey, the in-between, the process, all that happens along the way. And so me as a Westerner, when I hear that it only took, the first time I heard that it should have taken about 11 days for the Israelites to cross through the wilderness, but it took them 40 years, I felt it in my gut. All that wasted time. Are you kidding me? Because I want to get to the end goal. I want to get to the promised land. I want to see the product. But the Easterners focus on the in-between process. So that when they look at the Bible, they understand it differently than I do. They're like, no, that 40 years was what it was all about. 
And you couldn't have the promised land without the 40 years of wilderness. Ursula K. Le Guin says, It is good to have an end to journey towards, but it is the journey that matters in the end. I learned this through a different avenue, Aerosmith. (laughs) When I was a teenager, they had a song called Amazing. And the line that always stood out to me was, Life's a journey, not a destination. Life's a journey, not a destination. And isn't this true? Don't we find the proof of this in our own Christian walk? If Christianity was about the end product, then we would believe in Jesus and immediately be raptured into heaven. But we're not. We believe that Jesus died for our sins and rose again, and that in him we have life and life eternal, but we still have to go through this life, this process, this walk. God never cuts out the in-between. He never cuts out the process. We have to go through the shaping and the forming of the wilderness. And whether we like it or not, this life is filled with wilderness experiences. The Bible includes example after example of people's wilderness journeys. And the Bible was given to us to help us make sense of our own lives. As I said before, and I'll say again, I think this is one of the most important points. When we read the Bible, we're not just reading a history book. We're not just reading about people back then. We're reading something that we're supposed to see our own lives in, in a different way. But we are to see, if you're not reading the Bible and seeing yourself in it, then you're not reading it properly. It's a story of your life. You're in those pages. It's your experiences. And not just the good mountaintop experiences, but the times where there's failures and difficulties as well. Those are our stories too. We're not just Peter when he gets it right and says, you're the Christ. We're Peter when he denies him as well. And yeah, we'd prefer an experience of life without wilderness, wouldn't we? I know I would. But this life is our wilderness experience. We are Adam and Eve, east of Eden. Adam and Eve were sent away from the garden out into the wilderness. And humanity has existed in the wilderness ever since. Wilderness has a purpose. Ironically, it's to draw us closer to God. Rather than wishing it away, we are called to engage the process. When looking at the wilderness, we tend to look through our cultural lenses. In a Western lens, we see form. So as a Westerner, we might describe the wilderness as barren and desolate, hot and draining, never ending. We might see some beauty in it as well, but also that it's harsh, it's quiet, it's rocky, it's sandy. It can be dangerous. It's lonely and lifeless. These are all describers of its form. Viewing it through a wilderness, through a a Middle Eastern lens, it might be described differently. The wilderness is a place that increases hunger and thirst. It heightens awareness. It provokes resistance and requires surrender. It invites change. It summons courage. It prepares and equips us. It stirs up both healthy and unhealthy desires uh, in us, which means it exposes our inner state. And most of all, it positions us for an undistracted encounter with God. These are all descriptors of its function. And now we see why God uses it. Now we see why the early church went out and found it and placed themselves within it. In the third century, many Christians left the cities to encounter God in the wilderness. How strange. What happened is that after Constantine made Christianity the official state religion, if you will, many in Christianity felt that Christianity itself had been compromised, watered down. This is how Christian monasticism begins. They leave the cities, they leave the established churches, and they go out to live in the wilderness where they can seek God unencumbered, where they have to depend on God again, where life is challenging once again. 
And this is how the desert fathers and mothers began, the Abbas and Amos. Hagar is within this tradition, right? They saw that the Bible was filled with examples of people meeting God in the wilderness. Hagar was sent in the wilderness and she meets God face to face and lives. Moses meets God in the wilderness. Elijah meets God in the wilderness. David meets God in the wilderness. The Israelites encounter God in the wilderness. John the Baptist, Jesus, Paul, The early church noticed a pattern and they realized that the wilderness offered lessons and they chose to engage it rather than avoid it. But the truth is we don't have to go searching for the wilderness. Wilderness has a way of finding us, doesn't it? Wilderness experiences are part of our life. The difference is choosing to engage it rather than wishing it away. Do this by seeing life through the lens of a journey rather than a destination. Accepting the reality that transformation takes time and it's a process, often an uncomfortable one. Rebecca Joy says, geographically speaking, it's not far from Egypt to the promised land. But as is so often the case, the journey takes longer than we anticipate and requires more than we knew we had to give. Moses spent 40 years in the wilderness before he was even ready to lead Israel through their own wilderness journey. So we have to ask, what was it that Moses had to learn in the wilderness that 40 more years of living in Pharaoh's palace wasn't able to teach him? And why could an Israel have went directly from Egypt to the promised land? What did they need that 40 years of wilderness provided? And even after Jesus had already had 30 years living life, perfectly and sinlessly, why did he have to spend 40 days of thirst and hunger and challenge in the wilderness before he was ready to begin his earthly ministry? Why the wilderness? Rebecca Joy says, the answers are found in the function of wilderness. It was a place of refuge, sanctuary, escape, transition and transformation, preparation, provision, encounter. Hagar the Egyptian, the Hebrews, and the desert fathers and mothers moved toward the wilderness, not away from it, because they seemed to have an innate understanding of what they might experience there. If you are presently in a wilderness experience, a season of life, I ask you, do you see yourself as merely a passive spectator in this place and time or an active participant? Are you just trying to get through it or are you growing through it? Are you just trying to survive or will you seek to thrive? in the midst of it? Are you being conformed by it or are you allowing God to transform you through it? Are you resisting it, wishing that it wasn't or are you yielding to what God might have to teach you and how he might shape you through it? This is the difference between just saying we believe and actually following Christ. It's a different posture. It's a different lens. Next week, we're going to talk about two purposes of the wilderness, to develop eyes that see and to cultivate ears that hear. This Wednesday night, we'll begin our discussion group again. Uh, there are books available in the fellowship hall. Uh, Rebecca Joyce sent them herself. Uh, so she signed the copies for a little more personal touch. So you can grab one of those if you want to join us on Wednesday night or maybe you can't be here on Wednesday night, but you still like a book and you'd like to journey through as we continue. It'll be a six-week series. So we have five more Sundays. And if you'd like to read along in the book, which is much more detailed than what I'm able to offer you on a Sunday morning, then I invite you to do that. You can also download it on Kindle as well. But we'll begin a discussion group on Wednesday night at 7. 
And we'll be answering some of the questions that come at the end of each chapter. So if you want to join us either on the journey this Wednesday or before you get to Sunday, uh, go ahead and read the first three chapters and answer some of those questions. And we'll be asking some of those questions for those who come together on Wednesday night. So we'll begin understanding the wilderness through a different perspective. And I pray, being able to see the goodness that God intends in it, that we might not resist it, but that we might embrace it and engage it, and that we might become conformed to the way and the image of Christ. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks. It's hard to thank you for the wilderness experiences, but we know the Spirit testifies within us that indeed, the wilderness is where we become most alert to your work in our lives. Forgive us for wishing it away, but we thank you for the grace that you give in understanding why we would. But Holy Spirit, help us to live with ever more intentionality that we might engage the wilderness and embrace it and know that it is there that we might meet you most closely and be transformed most fully. Help us to understand that this life itself is something of a wilderness and that we are on a journey and one day we'll indeed reach that promised land as so many have before us. But until then, may we engage the process. May we live with intent. May we walk with you in this place by the power of your Holy Spirit that is at work within us. He can do more than we could ever ask, think, or imagine. May you be glorified in the church, in our lives, throughout the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.